Hello and welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine Office of Wellbeing Crisis Leadership Training. The purpose of this training is to offer tools for effective leadership during a crisis. Over the next 20 minutes, we'll provide an overview of the psychological response to disasters, describe four pillars of crisis leadership, and review 10 leadership principles to guide action. Our host during our time together is Dr. George Everly. Dr. Everly is a world-renowned expert in disaster psychology, crisis leadership, and human resiliency. For over 40 years, he has responded to disasters both natural and human-made around the world. Dr. Everly has studied crisis leadership, crisis communication, and resilient leadership, having developed the rapid psychological first aid method used by our RISE teams and written the Johns Hopkins Guide to Psychological First Aid. Dr. Everly holds appointments as Associate Professor in Psychiatry and Associate in Public Health at Johns Hopkins and as a Professor of Psychology at Loyola University. He is also a member of the Johns Hopkins Center for Public Health Preparedness. We are grateful to have Dr. Everly here with us for this training and we look forward to conversations with you at the end of his talk. Hello, I'm Dr. George Everly. I'll be your host through this presentation. This presentation was developed by myself and my colleagues, Dr. Deborah Dang, Dr. Albert Wu, and Dr. Carolyn Fowler. In harm's way, a psychological perspective. The COVID-19 pandemic requires that we put people in harm's way, not just for physical injury, but potentially psychological injury. And what I mean by that is an increased risk for burnout, for psychological vicarious trauma. So we're actually accelerating the risk, potential risk, uh, for healthcare worker burnout. And what does that mean? Burnout is a form of exhaustion, both mental and physical. In the short term, we may be eroding healthcare worker well-being, we may be eroding resilience. In the long term, we may be fostering absenteeism and even people reconsidering careers. We may be even increasing the long-term risk for chronic burnout and post-traumatic stress disorder, perhaps even uh, mental disability. It sounds ominous, doesn't it? But there's something we can do about it. And that's the goal of this program, to enhance well-being and resilience here at both the organizational level here at Johns Hopkins and the personal level, by supporting our workforce, by strengthening crisis leadership at the executive and frontline leadership levels. The learning objectives are very simple. Recognizing the phases of psychological response to the COVID, We'll talk about applying evidence-based principles for communicating and leading during a crisis. We'll talk about COVID and why frontline leadership is so important and what specific guidelines or actions both policymakers and frontline leaders can take. We'll also take, talk about resources that are available. And there's a vast array of research, resources if only they will be utilized. So let's start with a chart. I've been to 39 countries on six continents, hurricanes, floods, pandemics, wars. And while they all seem very different, they share something. They share a final common pathway, psychologically speaking. So the good news for public health planners and clinicians alike is that disasters follow predictable psychological patterns that will allow us to better intervene, better plan. And this slide captures that. It uses a heuristic developed by Diane Myers and Leonard Zunin many years ago, but it certainly has value. Statistician George Box once said that all models are wrong, but some are still useful. This one is useful. So, the impact is when the agent, in this case, the virus, is revealed. It makes an impact on the population. Confusion, 
fear, anxiety, even denial in the early stages may be in evidence. But we quickly begin doing what we're trained to do, and that is heroic things. We save lives. We provide health care. We ride the adrenaline wave. Eventually, we will make it through this, and we enter a honeymoon phase at that point. And this is where we take a collective sigh of relief. We do the high fives, virtually, of course, but we're glad it's over. But then psychologically, something else happens. There's usually a letdown, and the letdown we call the disillusionment phase. This is where you encounter anger, frustration, depression, grieving, and even despair, perhaps. People ask the question, why did this happen? Why weren't we better prepared? Why weren't we better supported, perhaps? We try to point the finger of blame, not understanding that it really serves no useful purpose. But we try to claw our ways back to recovery, to rebuilding, to reconstruction, to where we were before. And leadership can play an essential role in helping us get back to our baselines, to where we were sooner rather than later. Leadership can help people feel supportive rather than isolated or abandoned. Or I should mention there's usually an anniversary reaction and we'll struggle through that as well. But again, we know that's coming. So effective leadership can prepare us for that. Our research has revealed that there are four pillars of resilient leadership. We've studied overall leadership effectiveness. We've studied crisis leadership effectiveness. And they boil down to four persistent factors. Leaders in crisis should express a hopeful vision. People follow people who have a vision. They follow people who are decisive, who can make a decision. What is also important is the use of the three T's of crisis communication, timely, transparent, and truthful. And lastly, people want to see leaders model the behaviors that they're talking about because behaviors that are facilitating recovery foster trust. If leaders model those behaviors, it engenders trust. Where there's a problem is when leaders say, do one thing, and then the leaders do another. We've boiled those four principles, or pillars, shall we say, down into 10 principles. We call them the 10 principles of crisis leadership. They're applicable to all letters, levels of leadership across all organizational settings. They should inform leaders in their decision-making and can actually guide specific actions. So rather than theory, we want to take these principles and apply them in actionable behaviors. Let's see how that works. The first one, structure is the antidote for chaos. Why is this important? Plans, routines, create a sense of community, continuity, and comfort. Have a plan. If you're guiding two, 22, or 2200, people want to know where are we going? How are we going to respond to this? What does the future look like? And while no plan is perfect, it acts to reduce fear and anxiety. Make sure everyone knows the plan. Communicate it. Don't take anything for granted. Hold daily briefings or huddles, beginning of a shift, after a shift. Plans are often changed. That's okay. Listen before you speak. Why is this important now? Stress, fear, anxiety all interfere with people's ability to reason and to follow even the most logical of guidelines. Abraham Lincoln once said the most valuable part of his day was the day he set aside to listen to the people who elected him, his constituents. He said he can learn from them. 
they, in a way, can guide him to better guide them. Suggested leadership actions provide opportunities for the staff to voice their personal and professional concerns. Make sure you ask open-ended questions. Listening does not mean waiting three seconds and then letting them know what you were going to tell them anyway. Listen carefully and then respond. Also understand that sometimes people lead with their emotions. Be prepared for that. Information is the antidote for anxiety. That's number three. Why is this important? Information can provide reassurance. It can empower people. We work with a group of remarkably talented, gifted people. Seldom do they want to be rescued. Rather, they want to be empowered. Perhaps that's the goal of crisis leadership. But we also have a formula to help you out. In providing guidance, in communicating, our research has shown that people respond to the following formula. Very simple four-step structure. People want to know what happened, even if it's on the shift, if it's overall, how did COVID get here, or anything in between. What happened? What was its cause? What are the reactions likely to be? Physical, psychological, financial, career-wise? And what are you doing about it? Understand that this message may change on a daily basis, but that's okay. Principle number four, empowerment is the antidote for feelings of powerlessness, feeling out of control. Again, as I mentioned earlier, number three, people probably don't want to be taken care of per se. They do want to be empowered to take care of themselves and they want to be empowered to make good decisions about their families. Suggested actions provide guidance on resilience, stress management, well-being. Use the resources, and they are vast, that we have available to us at Johns Hopkins. They are remarkable resources. They are useless if we do not use them. But also mobilize the resources that you have in front of you. Ask the staff, how do they cope? How have they coped in the past? What lessons have they learned? Perhaps there's something that they can share that you've never heard before. Perhaps there's something they can share that will help other staff members. You know what that also does? It makes them part of the solution. It empowers them. Number five, people trust actions, not words. People trust leaders who demonstrate and model the behaviors they expect from others. So share your personal feelings. Encourage others to do the same. Practice what you preach. If it's social distancing, then do that. If it's wearing a mask, then do that. Praise and thank colleagues frequently. Praise in public. If you have to criticize as much as possible, do that privately. Accept responsibility. You're the leader. But share success. That makes a strong team. Number six, perceive support as the antidote for isolation. The number one predictor of human resilience, the support of other people. Who's got your back? People in the front line are asking, who's got my back? And they're looking to you. Do you have my back as a leader? How demoralizing it would be if you do not. How demoralizing would it be if you do have their backs, but they don't know it? Suggested leadership actions. Be visible. Walk around. Leadership by walking around is sometimes called. Set aside some time where people can reach out to you. Monitor the pulse of your unit as best you can. And use non-traditional channels. Remember, social media has made this a whole new world. People say some things in social media, media that perhaps they would not be comfortable saying elsewhere. Cohesive groups do better in times of stress and challenge. Charles Darwin taught us that. He said the groups, the communities that are most likely to survive extreme adversity have two characteristics. They identify with one another and are highly cohesive, and they're highly flexible. Flexibility 
he said, outweighs strength. Suggested leadership actions provide structured opportunities for connections. We've mentioned huddles, debriefings, look for opportunities, formal and informal, to connect. Use inclusive language, we, us, our. You do not want to set up a situation where it's an us versus them atmosphere. That serves no one. Acknowledge and appreciate teamwork and connectedness. Remind people they are a great part of something far greater than themselves. We are at one of the great institutions of healing and of learning. Remember that. You have a legacy. There's no such thing as an information vacuum. If the leader is not speaking, someone else is. Oftentimes, it's the person who's most distressed with the fastest thumbs and the widest Twitter feeds. That's not leadership. Remember, people look to you for guidance. Provide information at scheduled intervals. This is what was done in the Washington, D.C. sniper. This was done actually in Wuhan. This was done at Virginia Tech, and the list goes on and on and on. Stress information and provide it in, in a plain, simple context, plain, simple language. Use as many channels as you can. There are the three T's again, transparency, timeliness, and truthfulness. This type of communication is essential to your credibility. Credibility predicts trust. Trust begins and ends with truth. Trust predicts cooperation and ultimately compliance. Communicate in a timely manner. Anticipate questions. Put yourself in their shoes. And once you do, ask yourself, well, what is it I really would want to know? Answer those questions as best you can. Anticipate them, at, if nothing else, and address them. And if you don't know something, say you don't know. The things that are really important, the takeaway messages, say it three times. Once in the beginning, once in the middle, once in the end, the rule of three. And number 10, the moment of absolute certainty may never arise. George Patton famously once said, the only failure in leadership is the failure to lead. How many times in your personal life, professional life, perhaps, have you waited for that absolute perfect moment and it never came. And then the opportunity for change was lost. Be decisive. Emphasize, of course, it is a, an evolving situation. It is a changing, dynamic situation. Provide updates as is relevant, but communicate regularly. So we have four principles, guiding pillars, we call them of effective crisis leadership, but then we've broken them down into 10 principles, hopefully actionable behaviors. And now we can apply them across the spectrum of the psychological phases of disaster. And you can see by this slide, we have a rather unique continuum of care. What makes Johns Hopkins special when it comes to dealing with the COVID we have a uniquely integrated and comprehensive continuum of care that withers and dies on the vine if you don't know it's there or you fail to utilize it. So here it is. What are the next steps? Meet with your staff, identify practices that will support your team, build cohesion and well-being. Use the resources that are replete throughout the system. Make sure your staff is aware of those resources. If you'd like to learn more about applying these crisis leadership principles, download the PDF notes version. Watch Applying Crisis Principles series, one short video for each principle. Dr. Carolyn Fowler and I have taken about five minutes, taken each one of these Principles, broken them down into five-minute videos. If there's one that you wanted to learn more about, go directly to that video or put them all together. And you'll see that we have presented them at, I think, even a more granular, applicable level. You can access all of these resources 
at the Office of Wellbeing's website, which is listed below. We hope to hear from you. Please email your questions, your comments, your suggestions to the email below. And nurse leaders, please add nursing as the first word in the subject line. Here are some references. We thank you for taking time out of your very, very busy schedule to learn a little bit more about dealing in a crisis from a leadership perspective. COVID-19, Crisis Leadership from the Frontline, a presentation of the Office of Wellbeing. I'm Dr. George Everly. Thank you for listening.